In this video we're going to talk about using a capacitive secondary pickup probe for measuring automotive ignition. This is a hostile environment for the nano, therefore if we can do this with the nano, we can probably do most anything else with the nano. So let's first take a look at the waveform that's involved. Here I've gone through the process we've discussed before in previous lessons. The difference is that here in column C I use this formula minus B3 and then I use column A and C to create this chart. And what that does for us is it flips the waveform upside down. Since it is a capacitively coupled waveform the average is zero or off in this case, slightly off, looks like it's 295 volts divided by 1000, it's off about 3 tenths of a volt <coughs> from being zero and that's inside the nano, and that's another subject. So by taking the, the negative of column B into column C and plotting column C we get ups an inverted waveform and you need this to look at engine analysis compared to the way everybody else looks at it. This is because the primary coil is on the positive side to ground and then the secondary is ground and it reverses so it's upside down. So at any rate by using column C now our waveform is right side up. So let's take a few looks at this thing. Thanks to labscopes.com on this page they explain the horizontal division settings for a parade which is all the cylinders or individual cylinders and how to hook things up. We'll go slip down here to the bottom. Let's slip a little bit faster than that. Get down here, it shows a secondary ignition waveform and it describes the various parts of it. So the coil saturation is the first part, and then the ECM steps it up so it doesn't burn up the coil and waits for the trigger, and then it fires a high voltage. Then this is called the burn time. Here they call it a spark line. This is called the nose. This is energy that energy is left over in the coil after the burn, after the fuel injectors turn off, therefore there's nothing to burn. So this energy causes this oscillation so it dampens out. Okay, first thing you notice there's a couple of differences here. We have the same coil saturation time, but notice the saturation is slanting up. That's because it's capacitively coupled. It can't hold the DC level, therefore it slowly rises as the capacitance charges. And then we have the current limiting spike, which stops from burning up the coil. And that would normally be a steady DC level, but it's falling because of the capacitance once again. Then when the ignition fires, the nano may or may not reach the peaks of this point, but the peaks aren't important for some analysis. In particular, this burn time is the most important part. This should be flat also, but because of the charge times of the capacitance, this is sloping down until it gets to the end. When the fuel injector turns off, or the burn it run, burns up all the fuel, then the leftover coil energy causes these oscillations right here. And then it goes back up to waiting. So we come back to this point over here. Okay, in the real world, what's important is what's on these flat lines, not the fact that they're flat. If there's noise on them, if there's ripple on them, for example, the ripple's probably coming from the alternator, and the alternator's screwing up your fuel injectors, and it's also screwing up your ignition. So it's important to see that there's no excessive noise other than this normal, what I call grass noise, on these flat lines. So in our case, even though the line's sloping, you can still see that there's nothing on there but a little tiny bit of noise. Now it steps up to the current limiting point. Once again, it's falling down, but there's still no major noise on here. So this is still useful information. When it fires right here, you notice it's sloping, sloping pretty much straight down a natural curve. There's no noise. If you had leaky intake or exhaust valves, then the, the leak of the air blowing across the spark plug would cause 
massive ringing right here, turbulence, they call it turbulence. But we don't have that on this particular waveform. And then the step shows there is some, the nose shows there is some energy left over, therefore the coil hasn't reached its saturation as far as delivering energy to the engine. So everything's fine in this waveform. And we don't need it to be flat on these areas to understand and analyze the waveform. Okay, let's take a look at one of these probes for a minute. Here's the three connectors on the probe. This is a BNC connector, and I have a plug-in BNC to phone jack adapter, mini phone jack adapter, which I bought from um, Seed Studio. So I can use any BNC connector easily on the Nano. So it comes with the BNC connector, it comes with the ground clip, and it comes with the clip to clip onto the spark plug wire or the coil wire. If we take a closer look at how this thing is constructed, we'll see that we have an, it's just a point on RG58 cable with the one BNC cut on, connector cut off one end. And it goes straight through, and the center wire comes out here and it grounds to this whole clip assembly. It's soldered to the whole clip assembly. There's a second wire, which is the ground wire. And that goes up in here and it's attached to, soldered to the shield of the RG58 cable. Then he put two thick heat shrinks over it. You can see there's one right here, and there's another one on top right here. So they double heat shrinked it, and then he just clamped the whole thing with the metal clamp of this probe, of this piece of metal here. Here's a picture showing the center conductor coming out and going right down, and it's soldered right to this whole clip assembly. You can see there's two levels of heat shrink right here. Actually there's three levels. There's a third level under the cable too. You got the cable, heat shrink, heat shrink, heat shrink. So there's three levels of heat shrink to keep the high voltage from breaking across this juncture right here. And then all they do is slide this rubber boot over the whole thing to help protect you from it and that's a capacity probe so how does this thing work when you clamp it on an ignition wire there's capacitance between the center conductor and the wire and this whole clamp assembly because of the dielectric insulation of the wire so there's a very very, very tiny capacitor here so that comes and goes down the center of the RG58 the RG58 itself has capacitance. Unlike resistors, capacitance, the voltage drop falls, the greatest voltage drop falls across the smallest capacitor. So most of the voltage drop is developed between the center conductor, the ignition lead, and this clip. The smallest voltage drop is between, is between the center conductor and the shield of the cable. That's the second capacitor. So basically it comes out to be approximately 1,001 based on the impedance of the capacitive impedance of the cable, the capacitive impedance of the thickness of the spark plug wire. Since this is much, much smaller than the capacitance of the cable, then they're guessing it's around 1,001. But you can't count on that. So that's the theory of how this probe works. Like I said, all I do is take an alligator clip with a wire they solder the wire onto the shield of the cable. They take the center conductor of the cable, they ground it to this whole alligator clip assembly. They put three layers of heat shrink on, heat shrink on it. They physically clamp this tab here to hold it in place, slide a boot over the whole thing, and they're finished. So that's the reverse engineering of this particular AC coupled high voltage probe. Because of these variables, you can never say that the absolute ratio of this probe is 1,000 to 1. It's in the ballpark. But really, the amplitude is not important, and here's why. In most situations, you do what's called a um, train train of ignition pulses. You look at, like if it's a six-cylinder, you look at at least six of them, so you can see all six of them. And you're looking for differences. Is this peak consistently different? Is there noise in here? 
is just width changing between different cylinders, and those are your indicators of problems. You know, absolute values are pretty much worthless because every ignition system, every car, the density in the air each day is different. So you do a comparison between cylinders. If, if all your cylinders have low compression, then you're not going to be able to detect that by looking at the various cylinders. Then you need the absolute value. But most cars worked on today don't have all the cylinders worn out, therefore the absolutes aren't all that important. Relative is very important. So if your nail is inconsistent on this on this peak, let it run through many cycles and notice what is the average. And if this average is different than the next cylinder's average, then you have a problem. In closing, I want you to understand that this ground is extremely important. This ground is what protects your safety, and this ground is what protects your DSO Nano or any other scope safety. The ground clip goes on a good solid engine ground before you connect this to the ignition wire. That way if something goes wrong and this shorts out, then the ignition is short, whatever might be voltage might be on there will go to ground. It won't go to you and it won't go to the nano. All that goes to the nano is the center conductor lead down there. And since there's no direct connection, you can't put a DC current down there to do any damage. So the coupled AC signal won't damage the cable. So don't forget, the ground has to be in a good solid engine ground or you're living very dangerously. So another reason for using this ground is that maybe this ignition wire is bad and an arc jumps across the insulation. When that happens, you're going to put the KV right here down the center of this cable. And that's not a good thing for your scope. I don't care if this ground is there or not. It most likely would jump across the center conductor of the cable to the shield, but we can't know for sure. Remember, in a normal situation, we don't have high voltage. All we have is a very big voltage drop of the high voltage here. So it normally isn't in the thousands of volts right here, what's on there. I'm just saying if the ignition wires happen to short out or jump across this, if you got bad insulation right there, it could jump over and put your KV right there, and that can create issues. To prevent this, what I recommend you do is if you want to clamp this thing on, I take a ground wire while it's running and put the ground wire right there and make sure it doesn't jump to that before you go putting this on your probe because if it jumps to the probe there's a good chance you're going to damage the scope. It's very unlikely this would happen. I'm just pointing it out because Murphy's Law says sooner or later there will be a bad wire and it will arc across and once the arc happens the arc is the same as DC so now this is all DC coupled to the arc. You can also get engine arc that takes a higher voltage, I believe it's a higher voltage, to fire the fuel mixture. So engine abnormalities can also make the ignition arc over through its insulation to nearby objects. So this is the reason I'm telling, I'm saying that if it was me, I put a ground on that at first, or get the ground close, make sure it doesn't draw an arc to ground before you plug it into your scope. So this concludes my my uh, opinions about using an HV probe. I can't be liable for anything you do, so just remember that it's your choices, it's what you do, it's not what I say.